Two flight attendants stood in the galley, smiling at each other as the plane prepared for takeoff. Usually, it would be a hectic time, ushering passengers in and settling them. Yet, this is a time for fun. Their flight is a ghost flight, devoid of passengers. If you ever wondered what the crew gets up to on empty flights, you're about to find out. They took a serving tray each, but had no intention of preparing food and headed into two separate aisles. It's aisle surfing time! The engines fired up as the plane rolls from the terminal to the beginning of its designated runway. The attendants placed the trays on the floor and stand on them. They held on to the seats and awaited takeoff. They're <laughs> laughing as the plane quickly accelerates. In no time, it's hurtling down the runway. As it rises into the air, the interior tilts. They let go of the seats, and as the acceleration continued, so did they. Straight down the aisle. The first person crashes out on row 8, while the second continues until the end. A new personal best, victory is sweet. While it does sound over the top, according to a safety trainer on the travel forum of Cora, aisle surfing is a real thing. The faint of heart could take the softer option to sit on the tray as it slides downwards. The imagination fires as to what else they may get up to. Laps around the interior, cartwheels down the aisles, skipping. They have a closed air cinema with their colleagues. Air discos or karaoke on board of the plane. If you're a flight attendant and your crew wants to party, choose a song on the seat screen and take the announcement mic. Your colleagues are waiting. There are no passengers around to watch your dancing. You can do anything. The sky is the limit. A crew member made a viral video while singing in the aisle of an empty plane. Millions have watched the quirky video. It's a shame there were no passengers. It would have been excellent entertainment. Some have even said they ate food designated for passengers. However, anyone admitting to such conduct or being caught would see them face immediate dismissal, even with a new surfing record. You may be wondering why there would be a ghost flight in the first place. There are many reasons. In Europe, airlines must fulfill their obligations and continue the flight even if no passengers are on board. Similar legislation exists in America. There are time slots that allow for takeoff and landing. The European Commission has a use it or lose it rule. If airlines don't comply at least 80% of the time, they risk losing their slots to the competition. Aircraft also can't be left at the airport overnight, as you might with a car. Sometimes they need to be prepared for storage and return to a particular location. In some situations, airlines continued flights and used passenger jets to transport freight instead. This type of proactive thinking has saved the financial lives of some companies. When you hear the term ghost flights, you may be thinking something a little spookier, like in a horror movie. And you'd be right, there have been actual documented ghost flights. In 1943, a flight on a combat mission disappeared following a raid on Naples. In Libya, the wreck was discovered, but not until 15 years later. None of the crew was found. The following year, a second expedition to the site found water fresh enough to drink, coffee that still had flavor, and radios and machine guns in working order. The public became fascinated. It was a ghost flight mystery. For most flight attendants, their everyday experiences aboard an empty plane aren't particularly spooky or as much fun as our aisle surfers. They're far too busy for all of that. Your typical plane will land, and the passengers depart, leaving behind quite a mess. Not everyone is as tidy as you and I. At this point, the cleaners race on board, vacuuming floors, picking up rubbish, and wiping down all surfaces so that the new passengers have an excellent clean environment. The cleaners must work fast, they have a deadline. The plane must be ready to take off again in under 80 minutes, sometimes a lot less, depending on the aircraft. This time is called turnaround. The more extended the plane sits on the tarmac, the less money the airline makes. They want to make the turnaround to be as short as possible. Time is money after all. While the plane is being cleaned, the ground crew are refueling. Many thousands of gallons are required, depending on the aircraft's size, weight, and length of the necessary journey. Without waiting for the cleaning crew to finish, the catering crew entered the plane. They often have to step around each other as meals are stored in the galley. The allocated meals must at least match the number of passengers on the imminent flight. Like fixing a torn seat, any minor repairs have to wait until a more extended stopover. As the organized chaos continues, the baggage holds are emptied by ground staff while the new baggage arrives. Some of the more complex handlings can be moving the luggage to the carousels. There isn't much room, and sometimes the handler will have to crouch down low to get the job done. A lot of strength and skill is required, and the clock is ticking. 
The attendants are busy too. They must ensure that the catering crew has filed the upcoming meals and drinks in their proper places. They check off their inventory and prepare for the incoming passengers. They exercise their face muscles. Soon, they'll be wearing that smile non-stop and saying, good day, 200 times in a row. While they're always friendly, they have to deal with all sorts of behaviors, which can test the patience of even the sturdiest of attendants. Based on a list of 17 behaviors observed through the years, a flight attendant would give the following recommendations to the passengers. The flight attendants at the boarding door say hello to every passenger. Sometimes over 200 times in a row, would you please say hello back? They're happy to help and recommend passengers push the buzzer only when necessary. The attendants collect trash during specific times, wear gloves, and prefer not to race back and forth. There's something that bothers most people when passengers take off their shoes. Please make sure to have a fresh pair of socks. If you sit in the exit row, please don't put any luggage under the seat in front of you, because it can block the way of the flight attendants. For example, if they need to use rubber slides urgently. Everybody knows about the rule to turn off the mobile phone, but not everybody knows why it's so important. Let's suppose all the passengers turn on their phones. In that case, the high-frequency electromagnetic fields of the mobile phones can disturb the plane's navigation system and cause false indications. There is a risk the pilot can make a wrong decision about the landing, especially if it's in terrible weather. The crew recommends keeping the seatbelt fastened during the whole flight, even if the sign is turned off, because heavy turbulence can occur unexpectedly, and the plane can be put 900 feet lower. You can loosen up your belt to feel comfortable, so the flight attendants will be happy you're safe. Passengers get into a confined space on board an airplane and may unconsciously begin an instinctive struggle for a place under the sun. Please keep in mind that this is a temporary condition. Treat each other with respect and keep your seat back straight while the food is served or when your neighbor gets to the seat. Passengers sometimes leave their headphones on while conversing with a flight attendant. The attendants may ask the passenger if they want refreshment, and they might get a blank stare in return. Would you mind taking off your headphones? Something that happens on every flight is when the plane is about to take off and someone decides that they want to go to the bathroom. It's all about good timing. Preferably not when the plane is hurtling down the runway at full speed. Please wait till the takeoff is over because it may be dangerous. While their job can be tiring, Fortunately for us, flight attendants are patient, kind, and friendly people. They push on regardless of how tired they may be. International flights in particular can be long, taxing affairs. So, who could blame them if they find themselves on a ghost flight and decide to let their hair down, aisle surfing a bit with pleasurable distraction? And what would you get up to if you happen to find yourself on an empty flight? Who doesn't want to cut down on flight tickets when they're planning a trip? Here are some useful tips on how to get the best deals. Some cities like London and New York have more than one airport, so consider flying through alternate airports. Some of these airports are too far away from the city center. That's why tickets will be cheaper on the flights that land there. I tried this one myself. Well, I landed at a place that looked like a cargo airport, but hey, there was a bus from there to the city center. Pros, the ticket was cheap. Cons, I spent an extra hour on the road to get to the center. What's the prime day to book a ticket? That's a heated debate. Apparently, Tuesdays are better for booking a flight. More specifically, ticket fees at around 1.30 p.m. can be the cheapest. So, if you have plans to buy tickets for your dream vacation, go for a hunt on this specific day and time. There are great websites where you can compare flights and catch the cheapest ones, and I'll get to them soon. But don't ignore the official airline websites. Many of them announce private sales for those loyal customers who directly visit their pages. If your agenda allows you to play with your departure time, do that. Traveling on an early hour flight generally equals paying less for tickets. To catch a 6 a.m. flight, you have to get up when most of the people in the city are still enjoying their comfy beds. In the early hours, you might have problems with how to get to the airport. Not all public transport works 24 hours. Another problem would be your cat accidentally turning off your alarm. This is why these flights generally come cheaper. The same principle applies to late night flights too. People generally don't want to fly after midnight, so prices drop accordingly. Look at the bright side. You have more time to wander around once you get to your destination. Flying with a connection is another way. 
it's a fairly cheap option, especially on longer haul flights. This method has a downside. Your plans can be changed with one word, delay. You might have to say goodbye to your connecting flight. Another thing you can do with connecting flights is to search for flights from the same country. Tourist destinations, mega cities, and capitals are generally more expensive. Travel to a smaller city and then depart to your destination. Many of us love cookies, but probably not the ones in our browsers. Staying incognito in the flight searching process will help you get cheaper flights. How? Ticket prices depend on demand, so companies use the data on how many people search for which tickets. Let's say you look for tickets to London and regularly check the airline website to get a good deal. Your data signals that you have shown an interest in particular dates and a location. That's how you see that same flight suddenly gets more expensive. The airline knows that you're likely going to buy it. This can happen even if you refresh your browser. Either stay unidentified or clear your cookies to take yourself out of this situation. Remember I recommended that you visit the airline websites directly? You can also sign up for alerts on price drops. If you think notifications are annoying even though they are useful, you can follow airlines on socials. Many companies use their social media accounts effectively and they sometimes give customers some last minute deals. In some cases, it's convenient to book tickets over the phone. For example, if you're in a group. Be aware though that some airlines add extra fees for completing a booking via a call. It can be as much as $50. You could get a day trip on your vacation with that money instead of spending it on words. If you must complete a booking by call, simply ask the person if they're going to charge you some additional fees for calling. While searching for a ticket, you can pretend you're in a different location. The best option is to change your location to the country you'll visit or the airline's home country. Let's say you'll go to Japan. Booking from the airline's website and changing your location via VPN would be the key to seeing lower prices. I said that I'd get to the flight comparison sites topic, and here I am. These websites are gems for giving you the best fares from several airlines and options. They recommend alternative routes that you haven't considered. Yet again, before clicking the confirm button, take a few seconds to check the airline's website. Booking directly and cutting out the middleman's fee can be a wiser option. The other potential benefit is reliable customer service. With some airlines, booking via a third party will turn this process into a tangled headphone cable like there's no tomorrow. I'll share a strategy for getting an entire row for yourselves. Imagine you're traveling with your BFF. One of you should book the window seat and the other one book the aisle seat. Other passengers will likely go for other seats and avoid the middle seat. This method cannot always work though. If the plane is fully occupied, there will be some unlucky person in between you. If someone books that middle seat, you can always offer them the aisle or window seat and continue to sit with your BFF. The second option is booking seats in the 13th row. Well, 13 doesn't have a good reputation as it is superstitiously considered unlucky. Chances are, no one else books a seat from this particular number. This one is a gift to you for all your efforts to get the best possible deal. Good job you're in the airport. You're watching your favorite show while waiting for the gate to open. Boom! An hour of free airport Wi-Fi is over. Here's a loophole to double it. Roll back the time on your device. When you change the time zone back an hour, the system won't understand it and it'll allow you to use it for another hour. My 14th point is about safety. Did you know that you shouldn't swap seats before the plane takes off without letting the flight attendant know? This rule applies to changing your seat with a person from a different row, not to the person next to you. This can cause the plane to make an emergency landing. The reason is related to weight and how it's distributed. Every plane has a takeoff weight limit. This number comprises things like fuel, luggage, and passengers. Flight attendants look out for the potential weight distribution. A pilot explains it like this. If you move some seats without asking them, you might cause an imbalance on the plane. If you ask the flight attendants if you want to change seats, they'll let you do it after takeoff. I mean, people get up and move in the plane all the time, so this isn't like you can't change your position at all, but it can be dangerous to do so without confirmation. Here's a fun fact, the black box, as its nickname, is not black, it's bright orange. 
Flight Data Recorder is its official name, and it's orange so that in case of an accident, the rescue team can spot it easily. Where do you think is the dirtiest place on the aircraft? Not toilets, not seat holders, it's table trays. There are more. The cozy blankets you ask for from the flight attendants aren't so clean either. According to a report, some airlines wash their blankets only once a month. Now that you know the tricks, you can plan your trip at a perfect price and uh, maybe bring your own blanket to the plane. Sit back and enjoy the flight. Good things come to those who wait. So, there you are. You have a long flight, or worse, a series of flights ahead of you, and it makes you stressed out. But don't worry, I'll tell you about some tricks and secrets from experienced travelers that will make your journey easier and more relaxed. First things first, tell me the truth. Are you an overpacker? Then I've got a solution for you. Try to use all the space available to you. For example, it's a great idea to put small items, like socks or a swimsuit, inside your shoes. Pack your scarf and belt into your handbag and so on. If you're going to travel with a backpack, put the heaviest items at the bottom. Also, try to roll everything. This way, your clothes will take up less space and will wrinkle less. Now, when going on a trip, leave your massive wallet at home. Instead, put all your essentials, like your passport or cash, into a small container or even a toiletries bag. You can also use a mint tin to keep your credit cards and money. Put everything inside, then cover it with a piece of paper and fill the tin with mints. Voila! The perfect hiding spot is ready. Leave large bottles of ocean or moisturizer at home. Get a contact lens case and fill its compartments with the products you need. It'll come in handy during the flight. The air is really dry inside the plane. You can use small travel containers for literally any product you think you'll need during your trip. But if you're worried some liquids might spill, put some plastic wrap over the top of the container and only after that, cover it with the lid. If you have some vitamins or other pills with you, you can get a travel pill organizer like this one from Amazon. It has several compartments of different sizes, and each of them can hold from 13 to 21 pills or capsules. It also has a sealing ring that will keep your pills safe from dust and dampness. Now, you come to the airport well ahead of time and decide to wander through the duty-free zone. And even though you weren't planning to buy anything, you can't help but put some products in your pockets. Oh, I mean your shopping basket. Don't blame yourself, it's not your fault. Lots of airports are designed in a special way that makes you feel relaxed and at ease. Yep, I'm talking about all those huge windows, a lot of light massage chairs, and comfortable seating areas. And statistically, calm passengers are 10% more likely to spend money on retail, duty-free, and food. One more way airports manipulate you into spending your money is by making you walk through the shiny, duty-free stores straight after the security check. But the most curious thing is that the walkway through such stores usually veers to the left. That's done because most people are right-handed, which means they'll use their right arm to pull their luggage and are more likely to look at the right side while passing through the stores. And the duty-free zone veering to the left leaves more space on the right where passengers are most likely to look. By the way, even though duty-free shops have a reputation for being cheaper than in stores, it's not always true. For example, sweets, beverages, and perfumes are likely to cost more at the airport. Plus, be careful with what you buy in a duty-free store if you have a connecting flight. Some airports don't allow you to carry liquids over 3.4 ounces through your layover destination, even if they're from a duty-free store and in sealed bags. Arriving at the airport two hours before your flight isn't really necessary. Sure, there are super hectic, ginormous transportation hubs where even two hours might not be enough. But in most cases, this recommendation is just an ingenious plan to make you spend more money on shopping, eating, and drinking. After you pass all the security checks and passport control, you'll have the golden hour ahead. That's 60 minutes during which you're most likely to open your wallet. 
to buy a coffee and sandwich, get a book to read, or even spend a hefty sum on a new perfume. Buying bottled water at the airport can easily make you go bankrupt. There's just one thing every traveler should know. There's free water at most airports. Just bring an empty water bottle through the security check and find a water refill station. These places are usually located near restrooms. If you can't find a modern refill station, there must be at least a water fountain. Now, if you have an opportunity, don't exchange cash at the airport. You'll never get a good rate there. Those who have forgotten to buy some currency beforehand can instead order it online and collect it at the airport. Some services only need a few hours' notice for such an order. Or it might be even better to use an ATM to withdraw some cash at your final destination. Now, to make your trip more stress-free, invest in a high-quality suitcase. This way, you'll be sure that its zipper won't break and your stuff won't end up scattered among other people's luggage. The best option is to get a lightweight one, too. You don't need additional weight while traveling, right? And spinner wheels will help you move your suitcase around much more easily. If there's a possibility, put an electronic tracking device into your suitcase before you check it. It'll help you track your bag during your trip. It doesn't have to be something expensive. You can get one at a reasonable price. Now, here's a very important tip. Take a picture of everything you've packed in your bag before you go to the airport. This way, if your luggage is lost, you'll be able to make a claim with the airline or your insurance company by showing them the items that have been lost. It's bound to increase your chances of receiving compensation for your stuff. You might also consider printing out a copy of your boarding pass and putting it inside your suitcase. This way, if your suitcase gets lost, it'll be easier for airport workers to identify it. Now, if you wear contact lenses, take them off before boarding the flight. That dry air inside the aircraft can dehydrate your eyes and make contact lenses immensely uncomfortable. Ow! When at the airport in a new country, you might be tempted to try some new food it has to offer or buy some unusual snacks to feast on later on the plane. Well, don't do this. Eating anything you're not used to before flying may result in spending more time than planned in the plane's bathroom. You know what I mean? Where's my passport? Ah, here it is. Whew. Wait, have I left my credit card at the store? No, it's here. Does that sound familiar? If you tend to worry about your documents and cards while wandering through the airport crowds, you can get yourself a multi-pocket neck wallet like this one. It has an adjustable neck strap and has enough space to hold your passport, cards, cash, and even your keys. If you're traveling with your family, you can get a large family travel wallet. You can find one spacious enough to contain all your documents and the most necessary stuff you need to have at hand while traveling. And if it's also divided into several named compartments, and some of these products are, you won't need to waste time trying to remember into which one you put your credit card. And here's a bonus fact for you. If you ever see the letters SSSS or star S star on your boarding pass, get ready for additional security checks. Instead of these letters, there may be a checkerboard pattern. Anyway, if you have any of these marks, your carry-on luggage can also undergo a thorough inspection. Why might they choose you for secondary screening? Well, some of the criteria are making a one-way reservation or paying cash for your ticket. In some cases, the selection is absolutely random. Hi there, I'm Tucker. Me and my human travel all the time, and together we've gathered a lot of pet plane traveling tips we'd like to share with you today. Now, I may be a dog, but my human always makes sure I have my own suitcase. It includes my health certificates and medical records and all my human's contact information. These are all in a pocket that's easily reachable, so we can provide them to the airport personnel if necessary. We always make sure I have all my food in bowls, as well as all my grooming tools and products. That includes my brush, some pet wipes, my leash, and bags for when I need to use the doggy restroom. I once lost my collar on a hike, so we never forget to bring a spare collar with my ID tag. 
Now, if we're going on a longer journey, I always bring my favorite toy and a blanket. It keeps me calm and comforted in each new location we visit. My human always makes sure to bring a list of dog-friendly restaurants and attractions. I always like to know my itinerary before I travel. Otherwise, I get a bit fussy. Airlines only let a limited number of pets on each flight, so my human always books me early. That's because some airlines have requirements that can take months to prepare. Now, I'm a Labrador, so there are no restrictions for me to fly on most airlines. But some cat and dog breeds aren't allowed to board planes because they're a bit more sensitive. Some short-nosed breeds, like the Boston Terriers, Boxers, and Pit Bulls, can't travel in the cargo hold because they may be prone to respiratory problems. But they may be able to travel with you in the cabin if they fit the size requirements. I'll most likely be separated from my human on board the plane, so he needed to get me a special crate approved by most airlines. It's large enough for me to stand, sit, and turn around. It's also lined with an absorbent bedding, just in case I get too nervous on board. Now, if your pup hasn't traveled in a crate before, do buy it in advance and let it get used to the new environment. With proper training, we'll actually enjoy staying in the kennel. We'll see it as a safe, comfortable place we actually like to hang out in. The easiest way is to just feed the dog in the kennel a few weeks in advance leading up to the flight day. Adding a comfortable bed in there and the dog's favorite toy is also something us pets like a lot. If our flight has a layover, we always pack a bit of dry food for me to enjoy in case I need a snack between the trips. The airline personnel will be nice enough to help me with it. Now, me and my human came up with this neat trick in case I get thirsty, too. We freeze my filled water dish the night before. This way, it doesn't spill during loading and will melt by the time I'm thirsty. My human always makes sure that my crate door is closed but not locked, so the airline people can open it in case there's an emergency. My crate is filled with ways to identify me, too. It has the words live animal written all over and my owner's name, cell phone, and destination phone number are also provided. We've even stuck a nice photo of me on the crate, just in case I get lost. They'll know where to return me and how to contact my human. Oh, did I mention I'm half cyborg? <laughs> Don't want to brag or anything, but my human did provide me with a microchip that may come in handy in case I get lost. It has all my information, like health records and ways to contact my human. Most airports and vet offices have special tools to scan it. Now, I really don't like this tip, but I get it. It's for our safety, blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't fill the pet's crate with a lot of toys. If the crate is too full, it makes it difficult for us to move around and adjust our position. Now, flying with a cat or a dog may make you eligible for early boarding ask beforehand if that's a possibility. Getting us settled before the flight can take some time, and those extra minutes can help both of us remain calm. Now, my human makes sure to tell every airline employee he sees, on the ground and in the air, that he's traveling with me. This way, they'll know if I need any special attention. I remember one time our plane got delayed, so my human made sure the airline personnel checked on me whenever they could. Really don't like this one either, but it's best to feed us pets a bit less before the flight. Some of us get airsick too, so keeping our tummy empty for a bit might help. Just skip the last meal you would normally feed us before beginning your journey. You know how it's best to go to the bathroom before boarding a plane? We need it too. So go look for a pet relief area in your local airport. Most of them should have one. Some smaller dogs, generally under 20 pounds, may be able to travel in the cabin with you. That's only if they're well-behaved and properly groomed. Always remember that most airlines will be able to refuse to board your pet at any time if the animal doesn't comply with the regulations. Also, keep in mind that the dog carrier you bring into the cabin will likely count as a piece of carry-on luggage. All throughout the flight, your pet needs to be safely placed under the seat in front of you. There will be no potty or cuddle breaks. Us dogs need to be in the crate at all times. Now, not all people like pets. I can't imagine why. And some may also be allergic. So it's best to keep us as contained as possible. Do talk to us to calm us down if we become nervous. We always like to hear your voice. 
Us pets really don't like to be away from our humans for long, especially in a new location. So please book a non-stop direct flight if you can. Fewer stops mean less stress for us too. You can also pick a weekday flight. Airports tend to be a lot less noisy on weekdays. If we can't go with you in the cabin and have to travel in the cargo hold, it's best to fly in the morning or evening during the summer and midday during the winter to avoid extremely hot or cold temperatures. Okay, I'm on the plane now, all safe in my kennel, with my water, toy, and some treats. But where am I exactly? Me and my human looked that up too. I'm in a place called the forward cargo hold of the plane. It's located beneath the cabin where the human passengers sit. The reason why we travel in this specific area of the plane is because it's temperature controlled and pressurized. We also don't travel with standard baggage because of the potential hazard risk. Now, in case you're wondering how much all of this is going to cost, the short answer is it depends on your pet. Prices vary depending on the transportation manner, the airline, and also the breed of the animal. You can expect to pay anywhere between 75 to 125 bucks each way for pets traveling inside the cabin. Some $200 are needed for pets that are in cargo. Very large dogs, however, can cost up to $2,000 since they do take up a lot of space. Once you get to your destination, go straight to the airline's specified cargo location. Us dogs are available about two hours after the flight's arrival, and we must be picked up within four hours. Otherwise, we'll be taken to a vet or boarding facility. So please hurry! Take us for a walk right away. We need a bit of a stretch, too. That pet relief area in the airport will also be a nice place to take us to. Oh, and don't forget the mandatory head pats and belly rubs. <laughs> yeah, right there. So, it's pouring outside when you get on a plane. If you were in a car, you'd simply switch on the windshield wipers and the headlights after turning the key in the ignition. Do pilots do that? Airplanes spark so many questions, and it's time for some answers. Do planes have windshield wipers? Yes, commercial planes do, but they're only used during taxiing, takeoff, and landing. Once a plane reaches its cruising altitude, pilots turn them off. The plane's speed is fast enough to clear the windshields from rain. Wipers might be absent on single-engine airplanes because the propeller airstream blows strong enough to keep the water away. What happens when a plane loses one engine in flight? Actually, it goes, hey, has anybody seen my engine? It was just here a second ago. No, nothing special. The plane actually just keeps flying. There are certificates for planes flying over oceans or long distances that state how long they can do it. For example, the Boeing 787 can fly for more than 5 hours without the second engine. It's enough for pilots to plan a safe landing. Well, why is it so cold on a plane? The temperature on board averages 74 degrees Fahrenheit, about the same as in most office buildings. But you feel so cold because your body doesn't move much, producing less heat to warm itself. The crew doesn't turn the heat up because hot air can cause some passengers to faint during the flight. Do airplanes have horns? Yeah, and some of them have a whole trumpet section. Actually, yes, they do have horns, but pilots don't use it to scare away birds or get other aircraft's attention in the sky. Hey, move over, buddy! Actually, you can hear that high-pitched chime only on the ground when the plane isn't moving. Like when an engineer checks something in the cockpit and wants to get the attention of a ground crew member. Why do planes leave white trails in the sky? It happens when the engine burns fuel. It ejects water and carbon dioxide that gets mixed with the atmosphere. And since the air is cold at high altitude and this exhaust is hot, the water condenses and may freeze, creating those white tails. Do airplanes have brakes? Yes, there are multiple disc brakes made of carbon steel material similar to the ones in your car. But using them only isn't enough to stop the plane when it touches the ground. The braking system also includes different surfaces that slide out of the wings and disrupt the airflow. Can a plane door open mid-flight? The cabin pressure is the force that won't let that happen. If someone tried to do it, they would have to overcome more than 24,000 pounds of pressure, the weight of a ship anchor. Plus, there are lock bolts deep inside the aircraft's structure that hold the door in place. 
What happens when lightning hits a plane? Now, statistics say this happens to every commercial plane about once a year. But the aircraft's metal parts and lightning protection systems prevent electrical buildup. So, in most cases, this leaves a plane with only a scorch mark on its surface. Why don't the seats and windows always line up? Good question! All commercial planes are designed with seats and windows perfectly aligned. But when an airline buys a jet, it often chooses to add extra seats. More seats mean more passengers and more tickets sold. And less of a view and less legroom for you. See how that works? Why do flight attendants touch the overhead compartment? You'd think that they're checking to see if it's closed tightly. But nope, they use a scalloped handrail hidden at the bottom of the overhead compartment for a steadier walk along the aisle. What are those white spiral marks on engines for? Well, since the ground staff wear hearing protection, they can't rely on their ears to decide if it's safe to approach the plane. Seeing that moving swirl on jet engines prompts them to stay away from the area. Why are there holes in airplane windows? Those windows actually have three panes of plexiglass. The tiny hole is in the middle one. It helps regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin, so the outer pane can handle the load. If the outer pane happened to break, the middle one, even with a hole in it, would still be enough to keep the window intact. That hole also keeps the windows from fogging up. Why are there hooks on the wings? If there is an emergency landing on water, passengers have to step on the slippery wings to use some emergency exits. That's why crew members secure one end of a rope to the door frame and the other to the wing through the hook. Another rope is secured in the second hole, safely leading passengers along the wing to the inflatable slide. Why do the wings have different colored lights? It's for Christmas. Now, that red light on the left wing tip, the green one on the right, and the white one on the tail make up the plane's navigational lights. They let other pilots know the plane's position and the direction it's moving in, toward them or away. Do planes have ignition keys? Well, since ignition keys are usually a security measure, most commercial planes don't need them. They're locked in hangars under 24-7 surveillance. To start the engine, a pilot just pushes buttons and turns switches. But smaller private planes, like a Cessna, have ignition keys to start the engine and even locks on the doors. Why are there triangles above the windows? These black and sometimes red stickers let the crew know which window is best to look out when they want to check the moving parts of the wing. If you get motion sickness during the flight, try to choose a seat between the triangles for a more comfortable trip. How can you get extra space on a plane? Well, if you're lucky enough to get an aisle seat, there's a magic button near the hinge under the armrest closest to the aisle. Press it, and the armrest will swing up to the back of your seat. Why are most planes white? Well, this color reflects the sun better than any other, so it helps keep a plane cool. It's also much easier to spot any cracks, dents, leaks, and other faults on the white surface. And paint makes a plane 1,200 pounds heavier causing it to burn more fuel. Airlines save money by not painting them. Why don't airplanes have parachutes for passengers? Well, like paint, parachutes would also add extra weight, around 8,000 pounds. Plus, skydivers must go through at least 4 hours of training to learn how to handle a parachute. Lastly, jumping out of a plane at 35,000 feet in the air is simply not safe, because temperatures at that altitude are colder than the Arctic minus 65 degrees. Why can't planes fly when it's hot? Well, the molecules in hot air are much more spread out. To lift a plane, you need dense air. That's why it gets harder for a plane to take off as the temperature increases. Besides, scorching weather can overheat the internal machinery or even melt some of its parts. So, if it gets 104 degrees Fahrenheit outside, your flight might be delayed. Why do planes have round windows? The very first commercial planes had square ones. But after some time, they started flying at a higher altitude that demanded the cabin be pressurized. Frequent pressurization and depressurization deformed and even broke windows with corners. 
they were replaced with round ones since they withstand the pressure much better. How do the oxygen masks work? Very well, actually. If the cabin is depressurized at cruising altitude, it loses oxygen. The masks provide that, but only for 15 minutes. It's okay, though. That's long enough for the pilot to descend lower than 10,000 feet, where the air has more oxygen and people can breathe normally. What causes turbulence? Your trip gets bumpy because of three main reasons – storms, mountains, and jet streams. Just like an ocean, air creates waves when it meets a mountain. And sometimes it has nowhere to go but up in strong currents affecting a plane. Jet streams are bands of swift winds that appear when warm air masses collide with cold ones. Storm clouds push air away, creating unpredictable waves. Why do planes sometimes dump fuel? If there's an emergency landing, pilots must quickly get rid of excess weight, since they didn't burn it, and get to the destination runway as light as they should be. The lighter the plane, the softer it'll touch the ground, so no blown tires or fire. Why are the doors on the left side? Well, the captain usually sits on that side, so aligning the plane with the terminal jet bridge is easier. They fuel the aircraft and load baggage on the right side. If passengers are coming in on the left, it doesn't disturb those crews. Why do they dim the lights during takeoff and landing? It takes your eyes up to 30 minutes to fully adjust to a dark setting. Dimming the lights at night or dusk prepares them in case passengers need to make an emergency exit. They fade the lights during the day to save some engine power. Why are most plane seats blue? This color is psychologically associated with safety and reliability, so flight-weary passengers feel less anxious. Besides, stains and dirt are less visible on blue. A mechanic from Illinois was called out to tow a crashed vehicle. As he approached the upside-down Ford Ranger, suddenly he was struck with inspiration. Now, most people would only see a wrecked car, but this guy saw a whole new type of vehicle. He then took two pickups, a Ford Ranger and a Ford F-150. Then, he spent six months working on a strange new vehicle. With the two cars combined, he created the illusion that there was only one. With enough room for passengers, it's even legally approved to drive along the road. With the four wheels on top all spinning autonomously in line with the ones on the road, he creates confusion wherever he drives. Yeah, it looks quite weird, even when perfectly parked. The importance of eating your greens is something many wholesale companies try to convey to their potential buyers. One company in England called Birdseye went to the next level. And they built a car in the shape of a pea to promote their product. It's built on the chassis of an off-road go-kart, and it has many parts from a Volkswagen Beetle. It may look like a toy, but it's not. Equipped with a small Honda engine, this little zooming green pea can even reach 60 miles per hour. Unfortunately, you won't see it anywhere on the road, as its only purpose was for a commercial. But it did gain a lot of fame from ads. Rumor has it, many people even inquired about how they could purchase this weird vehicle. In 1964, a small, lightweight Jeep called the Mini Moke was designed in the US. They offered it to Great Britain with the belief that it would suit their terrain. Still, the car was rejected for its low ground clearance, and the open side doors weren't quite adapted for the English weather. It was further offered to warmer climates in Portugal and Australia. The idea was that it could be used for tourism, and it could be an easy way to travel around. But without any other use for fun activities like four-wheel driving, it lost popularity. Still, with the introduction of electric engines, it's making a comeback. Well, it's no surprise, the clearance now is higher, the seats are more comfortable, and the price is quite affordable too. The car costs about $21,000. In the early 20th century, cars began to rule the streets. Some of them were steam-powered, but that was far too noisy. There were even electric vehicles, but as they couldn't be powered outside of cities, they also failed to catch on. But there was another, stranger design. In the early 1920s, the Layout Helica was invented. It was also called the plane with no wings. 
In this car, the driver sits in the front with one passenger seated behind. Yeah. The aerodynamic body of Layat Helica is structured similarly to a plane. It's mostly made from plywood with a large propeller on the front to push the car forwards. The designer believed that all the added weight from normal car parts added unnecessary weight. At the time, steel was incredibly important for other uses, and the lightweight frame was his solution. Weighing about 550 pounds, this vehicle could reach speeds up to 106 miles per hour. That all sounds fantastic, but there was a serious downside. The car was incredibly noisy, and to protect their ears, people had to wear similar headwear as though they were in an actual plane. Not the best choice for a road trip, but surprisingly, 30 of these were sold. With a shortage of fuel in the 1940s, inventors were trying to find alternate forms of transport. The electric vehicles were looked at again after being left on the drawing board for the past 30 years. So, a brand new electric car Lof Electric was designed in 1938 and then built in 1942. It's a three-wheeled egg-shaped vehicle with room for only one passenger. This egg on wheels was powered by a battery pack. One full charge was enough for this little egg to travel up to 63 miles. It could ride along the roads at its top speed of 44 miles per hour. This tiny car was also quite lightweight, only about 770 pounds. I wish I had such a car today. It would squeeze into any parking spot. Yeah. Bonus, there were no blind spots in this car with a 270 degree view around it. But unfortunately, it didn't catch on and only one was ever made. German engineering has always been at a high standard with automobiles and one model, the Amphicar, took them to another level. A car that could also be driven into the water and could function as a boat. While driving at modest speeds on the road, the wheels are slightly lower than normal, but once in the water, the front wheels work as rudders. It could sail at a speed of up to seven knots. The designers were aware that it wasn't the best boat or car, so they advertised it as the best boat driven on the road and the best car to sail on water. It was actually pretty decent as a seaworthy vessel. Many people were surprised that there were no leaks, even if left docked for several hours. It grew in popularity and almost 4,000 vehicles were sold in the 1960s. It even inspired several more models of boat cars in the automobile industry. Have you ever wanted to hire a limousine? What if the limo is crossed with a plane? One guy decided he wanted to combine his love for a 727 plane with the ability to drive it on the road. Yahoo! First, he found a plane. Then he removed the wings and the tail from the body and attached the plane's body to a Mercedes-Benz bus. So it's kind of a regular bus in a plane's disguise. Stretched at 52 feet, it became the biggest limousine in the world. There's enough room for 40 people but it can still drive at up to 124 miles per hour. The cockpit is mostly preserved. However, a steering wheel was replaced to drive the limo, for obvious reasons. The original folding staircase still works, making it a nice welcome to passengers while boarding the Boeing limo. Ooh. Surprisingly, it's registered to be driven on the road, and you can even rent this 24,000-pound limousine. At the beginning of the 20th century, car engines became a lot more efficient, and the availability of affordable gas helped automobiles really kick off. Back in 1927, car designers invented something really posh. Meet Bugatti Royale. It was the most luxurious car ever made. At 21 feet long and weighing 7,000 pounds, almost twice the average weight of a sedan built today. However, at the time of its creation, there was a great decline in the economies around the world. Unfortunately, this lavish car wasn't a success. Even the royalty of Europe had no interest in such an extravagant purchase. 25 had been planned to be made, but as interest faded, only three were sold. The production line ceased with only seven built in the end. The engine design was based on a French aircraft engine and is the largest ever built. But following the failure of the Bugatti Royale, 
the remaining engines were reused for newly built high-speed rail cars for the French railway system. In 1930, an inventor, John Archibald Purvis, created something he believed will be the high-speed vehicle of the future. He got his inspiration from designs made by Leonardo da Vinci. John felt that the brilliant man was onto something. He then created the Dynosphere, a mono-wheeled vehicle that ran on electricity. This 10 feet high singular wheel, made from lattice iron and covered in leather, weighed around 1,000 pounds. The driver's seat and the motor are connected and mounted on wheels. At first, steering was only possible when the driver leaned to either side, but later, a steering wheel was implemented to make it easier. It could reach up to 30 miles per hour. There was some interest in it as a fun activity for the beach. Ah, and a modified version with eight seats was also made. But unfortunately, the designer's vision of giant wheels covering the highways instead of cars didn't come true. Probably because he has yet to find a way to stop it from moving, other than running into something. That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be cleaned to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing, but it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, only this time it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. You shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, the ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin, so you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. 
The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit. Follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. And that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be opened from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4-5 to times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask, and pilots must always remain conscious. The seats are blue in most aircraft because this color soothes people. It's also easy to keep clean. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding the plane is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right beneath the cabin, so it can sound quite loud sometimes. On most flights longer than 7 or 8 hours, pilots have access to a specially designed rest seat in or near the cockpit. Flight attendants typically have a section of the cabin reserved for them, and it's sometimes separated from the passenger areas. Some larger aircraft even feature private crew quarters above or below the main cabin. The wings of most passenger aircraft are located at the bottom of the plane. It's called a low wing. Firstly, if you install the engine under low wings, it'll be closer to the ground and easier to repair. Secondly, the wings will take on part of the shock in case of a hard landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. By the way, a plane can stay afloat for 10 minutes to 60 hours. It all depends on the model of the plane, weather conditions, and pilot skills. Now, most airplanes are white because this color best reflects the sun rays and the aircraft body doesn't heat up as much. Also, the damage is best seen on white, and white paint is simply cheaper. Shoulder straps seem more secure than just a waist belt, but not in the case of planes. When the plane gets into turbulence, it's tossed a bit in the air. The waist belt will simply hold you in place in case of a more severe shake. Shoulder straps would require more space between the seats, and this is not justified on a plane. In a car, the impact is usually much stronger, so you need that shoulder strap not to whoosh through the windshield. Flight attendant seats do have passenger straps, but that's because they are much less comfortable than passenger ones. They're narrower and positioned facing the passengers. Flight attendants need extra protection simply not to fall off their seats if the plane shakes hard enough. Also, they have to help and direct people during potential evacuation. And for that, they need to be in top shape. 
Now maybe you've noticed that you always enter the plane from its left side. Firstly, the captain usually sits on that side. This way, it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. If passengers come from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed. The Himalayas have some of the highest peaks in the world, including Mount Everest. But it's no surprise airplanes find it difficult to navigate the area. But why are commercial airplanes actually banned from flying there? For starters, these mountains have an average height of more than 20,000 feet. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the entire world, stands at 29,037 feet high above sea level. The area is rough, filled with snow, and has almost no flat surfaces. In case of sudden cabin depressurization, it would be really difficult to perform an emergency landing since there's literally no flat area there. More so, the low oxygen environment at such an altitude means there's likely to be a lot of turbulence. Not only is it really unpleasant for passengers, but random air movements and high wind velocity means that it's really difficult to maneuver the airplane. This area is also quite low populated, so there's not much there in terms of radar systems. And radar is crucial for aviation safety. Without radars, pilots would be unable to communicate with the ground to figure out flight conditions. It can also get so cold up there that jet fuel might completely freeze. Sure, the fuels used in airplanes usually freeze at around negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, but it may be possible above Everest. The lowest temperature was recorded there back in December 2004, when thermometers showed a staggering minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. So, no wonder pilots don't want to ever take that risk, especially on a commercial flight. Among the few airports located in the Himalayas, there is one considered to be the most challenging to land in the world. Only eight pilots on the planet are certified to do it. It's called Paro International Airport, and it's located in Bhutan, a landlocked country in the eastern Himalayas. First, landing there is so dangerous because you're literally flying through some of the world's tallest mountain peaks. Not to mention that those eight pilots also have to consider strong winds. Despite the challenges, they do manage to safely land over 30,000 people each year. Moving further, there's no radar there to guide the pilots, so they need to maneuver the aircraft entirely in manual mode. The pilots need to track their movements based on specific visual landmark checkpoints as they approach the runway. Moreover, flights are only allowed there during daylight hours and under good visibility. These pilots also need to watch out for utility poles and roofs on the hillsides too. It means they often squeeze their planes between mountain peaks at 45 degree angles before dropping quickly onto the runway. No wonder only two airlines fly to Paro International Airport. Apart from these commercial pilots, there are specially trained helicopter rescue pilots who spend most of their career at 20,000 feet in the sky. Most of the time, they partner with equally experienced climbers who train by crossing the Kumbu Icefall. It's dubbed the most dangerous square mile on the planet. Made up of ice pillars as tall as a six-story building, this huge stretch of the glacier on Everest's western side is filled with bottomless ice holes. It takes between 4 to 12 hours to get from one edge of the icefall to the other, depending on the experience of the climber. You may think it's a pretty serene location since you're literally only surrounded by ice and snow, but these local professionals claim otherwise. One Everest veteran said that the noise was actually the worst part of the job. The mountain produces awful squeaking sounds and sometimes even sighs. It often makes people feel like it's talking to them, warning them about the treacherous environment. Mount Everest isn't the only no-fly zone in the world. Surprisingly, Disney parks are also part of this exclusive club. So you won't ever be able to look out of your plane window and see the beauty of fairy tale castles from up above. In recent years, a lot of crowded tourist attractions, including Disney parks, have increased their security measures to make sure their visitors are as safe as possible. As such, no aircraft is allowed to fly within 3,000 feet of Disneyland in California or Walt Disney World in Florida. It was initially a temporary ban, but this rule became permanent back in 2003. Some other places don't have planes flying over them because of their historical importance, like Machu Picchu located in the Peruvian Andes Mountains. 
there's also a large number of rare wildlife species and plants that grow exclusively in this area. It's crucial that they're protected as well as possible. What does it have to do with planes not flying over that area? Firstly, it reduces the volume of harmful chemicals in the area. Secondly, if a plane ever needed to perform an emergency landing in this location, it'd cause irreversible damage to buildings and wildlife. Surprisingly, planes can fly over the Greek Parthenon in Athens, but with one condition, not to get closer than 5,000 feet above it. This way, the historical building is kept a bit more protected from any emergency landings, since there are specially designated areas around it. You won't be able to see the Taj Mahal from above either, since it's one of the most important, oldest, and most beautiful pieces of architecture in the world. It also needs added security features. This building dates back to the 1600s. UNESCO announced it a World Heritage Site in 1983. The Indian authorities set up a no-fly zone above it in 2006. They did it to safeguard not only the building itself, but also the crowds of tourists that come there each year. 7 to 8 million people. Buckingham Palace is well known for being the residence of British monarchs. So, for the Queen's security, a no-fly zone was set up here too. Planes aren't allowed to fly over Windsor Castle either to make sure the royal family is equally protected. Other important British buildings with no-fly zones include Number 10 Downing Street, the British Prime Minister's official residence and office, and the Houses of Parliament. George Washington's home in Mount Vernon, Virginia, can only have planes flying above it at more than 1,500 feet. The historical wooden mansion was built for President George Washington between 1758 and 1778. Unfortunately, the building has seen a lot of damage over the years. So, in an effort to preserve it better, authorities decided to prohibit vibrations produced by flying aircraft. That's why another no-fly zone was established there. It covers the airspace above this National Historic Landmark. That's probably the reason why you'll rarely see pictures of this house from above. Since it's the resident of the US President, it's not allowed to fly over Washington, D.C. It's also the home of Congress and other establishments. So, the authorities set a special flight rules area, stretching for 30 miles around Ronald Reagan International Airport. This means that it's one of the airports with the most precise takeoffs and landings. Pilots have to carefully tackle no-fly zones, which sometimes results in uncomfortable takeoffs for passengers. Whenever a pilot breaks a no-fly zone, it's a big problem, like the one that happened back in 2005 when a pilot accidentally steered the plane into a prohibited zone. The capital had to be evacuated immediately, and their regular activities were interrupted. Other capitals of the world have similar requirements, like Budapest, for example. In the capital city of Hungary, planes aren't allowed to fly over the ancient inner city of Pest and the Buda Hills. Almost all air traffic is generally prohibited above Paris, too, with some exceptions. Aircrafts flying no lower than 6,500 feet. Flying helicopters are also a big no-no within the city limits. Only certain choppers undertaking precise missions can get special authorization. Generally, passenger planes aren't allowed near the island of Manhattan either, partly because of the really tall buildings there and the added risk of collision, but mostly because all three major New York airports, John F. Kennedy International Airport, Newark Liberty International Airport, and LaGuardia Airport are very close to each other, so the air traffic in the area has to be really well thought out to make sure the planes don't cross paths. Pan American Flight 6 was finishing an around-the-world trip with several stops on its way. On October 16, 1956, the Boeing 377 Strato Cruiser, dubbed Sovereign of the Skies, left Honolulu and was heading for San Francisco. It was the flight's last leg, but no one could predict this phrase would turn out to be not just a figure of speech. The plane had to start its journey at 7.30 p.m., but some maintenance issues delayed boarding for almost an hour. The passengers were getting a bit impatient. The plane finally took off at 8.26 p.m. and soon reached the altitude of 13,000 feet. For some time, the aircraft was experiencing turbulence, which made it impossible to serve dinner. Several hours later, the lights were dimmed and the passengers stretched across empty seats preparing to have a peaceful sleep. 
Little did they know that sleep was the last thing they were going to get that night. At about 1 a.m., the cockpit crew got permission to climb to 21,000 feet. But once the aircraft reached the needed height, a terrible thing happened. At 1.20 a.m., one of the plane's engines started to overspeed. George Hacker, the first officer flying the plane, tried to deal with this problem by slowing the plane down. It didn't work out. This made Captain Richard Ogg cut off the oil supply to the engine altogether. After a while, the engine conked out, but its propeller kept windmilling in the airstream. It caused the aircraft to start losing precious fuel and seriously slowed down its speed. The plane was moving far too slowly now, just 174 miles per hour. It was also losing altitude at an alarming pace, at the rate of 1,000 feet per minute. The three remaining engines were struggling, trying to decrease the breakneck speed of the descent. At least, they were still functioning. It made the pilots feel somewhat hopeful. But all of a sudden, the captain noticed that the fourth engine started to fail. It was producing just a bit of power, even though it was working at full throttle. At 2.45 a.m., the unavoidable happened. The fourth engine started to backfire, and the pilots had to shut it down. Now the plane had only two working engines and was moving more and more slowly. The crew calculated how much fuel the aircraft was consuming, and a heavy silence filled the cockpit. The pilots had nothing to do but face the awful truth. The plane didn't have enough fuel to reach San Francisco. Neither could it return to Honolulu. Captain Ogg sent a radio message to the U.S. Coast Guard. Pan Am 90943, Flight 6, declares an emergency over the Pacific. At that time, a Coast Guard cutter was always on patrol between Hawaii and the California coast. Such ships passed on radio messages to the nearest airplanes and provided them with weather information. They were usually placed near the points of no return. Those were the areas where a plane would have already burned so much fuel that it wouldn't have a chance to turn back if something went wrong. That night, the Coast Guard cutter was the 255-foot Pontchartrain, and William Earl was the commander. The plane headed toward the ship and leveled off at an altitude of 2,000 feet. Then, it started to fly above the ship in 8-mile circles, waiting for daylight. It was crucial to see the surroundings, because the pilots had to keep the aircraft's wings level with the ocean, and it would be impossible in the dark. During the day, it would also be easier to rescue all the passengers. The captain's decision to ditch the plane carrying 24 passengers and 7 crew members wasn't an easy or hurried one. He had to weigh numerous factors. Should I get rid of the fuel to make the plane lighter? Should I land now or wait until daylight and better visibility? But one thing was crystal clear. Having lost two engines, the plane was burning the fuel too fast. There was no other solution but to ditch into the ocean. As the stratocruiser was circling the Coast Guard cutter, it managed to climb from 2,000 to 5,000 feet. It caused the plane to consume more fuel and become lighter, which was a good thing. The lighter the aircraft, the longer it would float on the surface. Plus, it lowered the risk of fire after a crash landing. The captain knew about an accident that had happened with another Pan Am stratocruiser. That time, the plane's tail broke off. That's why Captain Ogg asked the passengers in the back to move toward the front part of the plane. Those who were sitting by the engines had to relocate too. Flight attendants removed all loose objects in the cabin and explained to the passengers what to expect. Since the problem started, the crew members had been doing their best to calm down the terrified people. When the passengers found out the plane was going to circle and wasn't landing in the dark, they were hugely relieved. Another comforting thought was that the Coast Guard cutter was out there, ready to provide them with as much help as possible. Luckily, the weather was good, and the ocean was very calm. At 5.40 a.m., Captain Ogg informed the cutter he was ready to ditch. The ship left a thick foam path in the water to help the pilots understand their height above the surface more clearly. At 6.15 a.m., the plane touched down. It was still moving at a speed of 105 miles per hour. It had already traveled several hundred feet along the surface and started to slow down when the worst possible thing happened. 
one of the wings hit a wave. The aircraft rotated nearly 180 degrees and its tail broke off. After that, in a matter of seconds, the plane's nose went under the water. One of those who had been on board the plane said later that all he could see at that terrifying moment was water. It seemed to be everywhere. But after less than a minute, it started to recede. The front of the plane resurfaced. People on the poncho train were staring at the disaster unfolding in front of their eyes, feeling numb. They were devastated. No one could possibly survive such a crash landing. But they were very, very wrong. All 31 people on board the plane were alive. Even more astonishingly, there had been just a couple of minor injuries. Once those on board the pontoon train realized the passengers and crew had survived, several rescue boats rushed toward the wreckage. Meanwhile, the captain and those passengers who had been assigned to help with the evacuation quickly deployed three life rafts. But when people started to climb on one of them, it became obvious the raft hadn't inflated properly. It started to sink. Luckily, the rescue boats were on time. They promptly transferred the passengers from the damaged raft to the cutter. At 6.35 a.m., the last piece of the wreckage vanished in the waves. By that time, all the people from the aircraft had already got to the safety of the Coast Guard ship. They stayed in the cutter's officers' quarters and reached San Francisco several days later. Pan American Flight 6 crash landing was the first accident when an airliner ditched into the ocean but managed to keep everyone on board safe. And the whole blood-curdling event was captured on camera. Life rafts bobbing by the plane's side, survivors being transferred to the rescue boats, the plane rapidly sinking and disappearing among waves. Sometime later, all the crew members got awards for tackling the emergency and keeping the passengers safe. Captain Richard Ogg was the first person to receive the Civilian Airmanship Award presented for the most outstanding skills and heroism. Is the sky like a desert? Can a commercial aircraft fly faster than the speed of sound? Can you fix a plane with a piece of tape? Let's check your intuition with this cool truth or myth airplane quiz. Make sure to note down your correct answers and share your score in the comments. So, the first one for you. Commercial airplanes are more fuel efficient than your car. True or false? That's actually true. Commercial flights have been more fuel efficient per person per mile than cars for more than a decade. Better technologies and a larger number of people that fit in one plane have decreased the energy intensity of traveling by air by almost 74%. As for cars, it's been just a 57% drop. Okay, how about this one? There's no row 13 on a plane. Well, come to think of it, I've never seen a 13A or any other letter on my boarding pass. What about you? That's true, but only partially. In those countries where the number 13 is considered unlucky, there's really no row 13. But in other countries, the missing number may differ depending on what is believed to bring bad luck there. Opening a plane door during the flight is a real safety risk. It sounds kind of terrifying to me, but is it true? You can relax, that's just a myth. For one thing, the doors are locked. But even if they weren't, no one can open the door of a flying plane. It's physically impossible. The cabin pressure won't allow anybody to do it. When an airplane is at cruising altitude, it's pressurized. The difference between the inside and outside is huge. In other words, the pressure inside the cabin pushes on the door and doesn't allow anyone to open it from the inside. Even better, the airplane door is called a plug door. Its inner edge is wider than the outer. That's why it acts like a bathtub drain stopper, corking the doorway without falling through. Your skin is drier on a plane than it would be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Can you believe this? And if you think this is true, you're absolutely right. The airplane cabin is pressurized and the humidity there is set to 20%. For comparison, in the Sahara Desert, the average air humidity is around 25% and your skin is used to at least 40% of humidity. That's why your nose and throat feel so dry when you're flying. Several years ago, someone posted a photo on the internet that became viral in no time. In this image, there was an airline technician, and he seemed to be fixing a plane with duct tape. So the question is, could it be true? Or was it just a fake? The answer isn't so simple. It wasn't your regular duct tape. 
So partially, this fact is a myth, but it was some kind of tape, known as speed tape. It costs around $700 per roll. It's actually an aluminum adhesive you can use to temporarily mend minor damage until you can repair it properly. Is it true that pilots avoid the Bermuda Triangle? After all, it has such a notorious reputation. Ships and planes simply disappear into thin air in this region. This one is certainly a myth. Today, people already know that there's no particular danger in the Bermuda Triangle, and planes fly over this area as usual. Airplanes mostly fly on their own, with autopilots doing all the work. Myth or truth? What's your bet? It's a widespread myth. Many people are sure that planes are some super automated mechanisms that can fly mostly by themselves, and pilots are there simply for backup. In reality though, flying is a hands-on job. It needs constant attention and a skilled flight crew. There once was a plane that flew twice faster than the speed of sound. Hmm, can it be true or is it too far-fetched? This fact is definitely not a myth. The Concorde could reach a speed of 1,330 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is around 767 miles per hour. And that's indeed almost twice as slow as the Concorde. You might have heard this scary fact before. Planes empty toilets right in the air. Sounds alarming, but is it true? Fortunately, that's only a myth. There's absolutely nothing to this legend. Airplane toilets use a vacuum-based system to transport all the contents out of the bowl and into a special tank. It's located in the rear part of the aircraft, and this tank gets emptied only on the ground. Ah, this is a tricky one. When a plane is flying towards the east, it can reach higher speeds. So, can the speed really depend on the direction? And this is true. It's possible thanks to high-altitude winds known as jet streams. They blow at a speed of 100 to 300 miles per hour. And since our planet rotates from west to east, aircraft moving in the same direction can use these winds to move faster. Do you think pilots can control airflow to keep passengers sleepy and relaxed and save on fuel? This one is definitely a myth. If you ask a pilot this question, you might hear ridiculous in reply. The truth is that pressurization determines the oxygen level in the cabin. How about this one? The world's tallest air traffic control tower is as high as a skyscraper. Can it be true? Or is it just an impressive myth? I know it's hard to believe, but it's actually true. When an airplane lands, it needs the assistance of runway lights and airport beacons. It's part of the responsibilities of the air traffic control tower. It also manages ground traffic. No wonder such construction needs to be extra tall. The new Bangkok International Airport in Thailand has a 430-foot four-tall tower. Its height is almost the same as the height of a 40-story building. It cost 18 million to build the tower. I've got another tough one for you. The sensitivity of your taste buds drop by 30% during the flight. Yes or no? This is true. The pressure in the cabin combined with the dryness of the air kind of numbs your taste buds. But the most curious thing here is that this mostly affects salty and sweet flavors. If you're served something spicy or bitter, you can still taste it as usual. Airline caterers try to take the decreased sensitivity of your taste buds into account while preparing airplane meals. They have to modify lots of good old recipes to make your food taste better. As soon as your oxygen mask is on, in case the cabin is depressurized, you can relax and breathe out. You can still use it till the end of the flight. I wish it was true, but is it? Sadly, it's a myth. Passenger oxygen masks usually provide enough air to breathe normally for 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, it's just a temporary solution. But in most cases, this time is enough for the plane to go down to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That's where people can breathe without using oxygen masks. And since planes descend very fast, the need for additional oxygen lasts for a few minutes at most. By the way, the oxygen system gets tested regularly during special maintenance checks. Plus, both passengers' and pilots' oxygen flow doesn't depend on electricity. 
Masks use individual oxygen generators, so even if there's some electrical problem on board, the oxygen doesn't get cut off. Many people say that the plane is the safest means of travel, but do you believe in it? That's a myth. Flying is the second safest. Studies show that the elevator is safer. Unfortunately, it won't be able to take you to the Bahamas. Okay, this last one was kind of a joke. Statistically, planes are indeed the safest way to get to your destination. So, how many correct answers did you have? Tell me in the comments below. Me, eight. Duh. Do you know the feeling when you've been trying to solve one mystery for your entire life? Nope. Well, Detective Anderson does. During almost 30 years of working for the police, he solved many riddles, caught hundreds of robbers, and helped save thousands of lives. There's a huge number of successfully solved cases on his record. At the age of 25, he caught a thief who changed his own face with plastic surgery once a year. When Anderson was 30, prisoners started breaking from jails all over the world. The detective successfully solved this case. At the age of 38, he discovered the secret base of a forbidden order in a volcano's mouth. By his 50s, he managed to explain all the most inexplicable things in the world. But there was something he couldn't solve. These were two mysteries from the 50s, cases of missing planes. All these years, Anderson has been scrolling through the details of this puzzle. Unfortunately, he was too young when this story began. All he had were guesses and notes. But today, a sudden thought struck him. For the first time in many years, he felt that he could finally solve this mystery. But to do this, he had to immerse himself in this story again. So he opened the closet and pulled out two old magazines with detailed articles about these incidents. The first one happened in the summer of 1955. July 1st, Pan Am Flight 914 was about to depart from New York Airport with 61 people on board. The plane model was a Douglas DC-4. It differed from modern aircraft, having giant propellers instead of turbines. So all passengers fastened their seatbelts. The plane started taxiing down the runway, sped up, and took off. It went high into the sky and out of sight. Its destination was Florida. The flight time would be three hours. Dispatching services were watching the plane on their radar when suddenly, Pan Am 914 disappeared. The operator tried to contact the pilot, but received no response. New York reported this to Florida. They said they couldn't see the plane either. Usually, pilots notify via radio if a plane crashes or gets into a storm. But this time, just nothing. After several unsuccessful attempts to establish the connection, they deployed large-scale search operations. Communication with the plane was interrupted when it was flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Therefore, the air company had to admit the aircraft crashed into the water. But this version had no proof. When planes fall that way, rescuers find floating debris. Some parts of the cabin or luggage always get to the surface. This time, rescuers found nothing. The plane didn't transmit any distress signals and didn't leave any traces of the crash. It seemed like it just disappeared into thin air. People forgot about this disaster for 37 years. And then, something bizarre happened. 1992, Venezuela, Caracas Airport. The control tower received a signal about an unknown aircraft approaching them. It was weird because it wasn't supposed to be there. There were no flights scheduled for that time. The plane was landing. The dispatcher and the rest of the airport staff understood that something was wrong here. The plane looked old, with huge propellers instead of turbines. After landing, the pilot contacted the airport. Where are we? The dispatcher asked him to identify himself. A few seconds later, he received an answer. We are Pan Am Flight 914, departed from New York to Florida, with a crew of four people and 57 passengers on board. The dispatcher didn't know what to do next. He and the airport staff understood what kind of plane they were looking at. What was this plane doing 37 years later, and almost 1,240 miles away from its destination? After a few seconds, the startled dispatcher turned on the microphone and said, It is September 9th, 1992. You know that? A long pause followed. Then, the pilot responded in a panic. Oh no, 
Jimmy, where are we? No, stay away. Let's go now. The airport staff saw the pilot waving his hands in horror through the glass. Then he started the engines and took the plane to the runway. Pan Am 914 increased its speed and took off. The dispatcher tried to stop him, but the pilot didn't respond. The plane disappeared into the sky, and no one else had heard of it since that day. Detective Anderson finished reading the article. He frowned and looked out the window. Raindrops were hitting the glass. The storm outside perfectly depicted what was happening in his mind at that moment. He seemed to know what had happened to that plane. All the clues were there, lying right in front of his eyes. But to know for sure, Anderson had to move on to the next case. It was another article, dated 1989. It happened in 1954. Santiago Airlines Flight 513 took off from West Germany Airport. The plane was due to land in Brazil in 18 hours. There were 88 passengers and four crew members on board. The plane hid behind the clouds and disappeared from all radar. Air traffic controllers were trying to contact the pilots, but didn't receive a response. 18 hours later, they called the airport in Brazil. Those dispatchers couldn't confirm this plane's landing and couldn't contact the pilots either. The search operation lasted for several months, but they found nothing. Just like in the Pan Am 914 case, the plane disappeared from radar while flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Two years later, the search operation ended and Santiago Airlines ceased its activities. October 12, 1989. Airport controllers in Brazil noticed a passenger plane that suddenly appeared on their radar. It didn't answer the airport staff's questions and just circled over the airbase. After a few minutes, the plane landed and nothing. No one opened the ramp. Passengers didn't get out. Pilots didn't respond. The aircraft was in perfect condition. One of the dispatchers realized that this was the missing Santiago Airlines Flight 513 that had been considered lost for 35 years. Airport staff approached the plane and opened the doors. What they saw there terrified them. The police, customs staff, doctors, detectives, and other airport staff members gathered around the plane. No one knew what to do next. There was no living person on board who could tell the truth. The plane disappeared in 1954 and appeared 35 years later in perfect condition without any damage. So far, no one has figured out what happened. Detective Anderson noticed the stories were very similar. Pan Am 914 disappeared in 1955. Santiago Airlines 513 vanished in 1954. The difference was almost a year. Anderson scratched his head and noticed another little detail. Both planes went missing from the radar the moment they were flying over the Atlantic Ocean. There are many myths about phantom ships and mysterious phenomena connected with the Bermuda Triangle. Detective Anderson knew these tales, but these two missing planes puzzled him. He looked at two articles and understood everything. Exactly. The solution was there, right in front of his eyes. Both stories were written in the same newspaper. There was no real dispatcher who communicated with the planes. Nothing was known about the passengers. No newspapers except this one published news about these missing aircraft. It seemed they just took the same story and changed the dates, locations, and names of flights. Yes, the case was solved. It was all fake. The rain stopped. Detective Anderson looked out the window and heard the sound of a passing train. He remembered another weird and fake story. A story about a phantom train. It took place in Italy in 1911. 100 passengers boarded the train of the Zanetti Railway Company. It went through the picturesque mountainous area, got into a mountain tunnel, and disappeared. No one else had seen the train since then. All the passengers were lost, but not for long. They appeared in the past. There were records dated 1845. One unknown doctor from Mexico City wrote about a hundred Italians who appeared in the city from nowhere. They were all dressed strangely and talked about one mysterious train. This was a completely made up story. There was no proof or records about this train and the people who got into the past. A loud sound interrupted his thoughts. Detective Anderson picked up the phone. 
He was silently listening to the person on the other end of the line. A minute later, he answered, yes. The detective put the phone down. It was a new mystery for him. In the Sahara Desert, the locals noticed a huge ship lost in the South Pacific 27 years ago. There was no crew on board, no cargo, and no flags. No one knew how it appeared among the sand, but wet mud formed around it because of moisture. It seemed like the ship had just teleported there from the water. Perfect! No fakes this time. Detective Anderson put on his hat and left the office. But this story is for another video. Welcome aboard our flight from London to Miami. It will take us 4 hours and 30 minutes. The weather in Miami is... Wait, did the pilot just say 4 hours and a half? It sounds like a dream, but it will most likely become our reality in less than 10 years from now. Boom Supersonic, an aircraft manufacturer, is working on a passenger supersonic jet called the Overture that will be able to carry 65 to 80 people at twice the speed of current commercial aircraft. One of the major American airlines is interested in buying around 40 planes. The plane that's going to cost $200 million has recently passed the wind tunnel tests. If all goes well, the first finished Overture prototype will roll off the line in 2025 and will travel at nearly twice the speed of sound. The plane will be able to show its top speed over the sea, so it should be ideal for transatlantic flights. And then, traveling from, say, New York to Paris should take no longer than four hours. But first, it will have to get all the official permissions to do it. Some people are skeptical about the whole passenger superjet concept as they remember the story of the Concorde. That high-end plane delivered people from London to New York in about three hours and serviced other transatlantic connections. The tickets cost a whopping $10,000 per seat and passengers got access to a super exclusive lounge with lobster and Angus beef for lunch. The Concorde went on its final commercial flight in 2003 it was a huge fuel guzzler. Plus, there are many complaints from people living near airports about the noise it produced. The Overture is supposed to be more fuel efficient, lighter, and have better software to make it more aerodynamic. The noise might still be a problem though, because supersonic aircraft need aerodynamic engines, which are pretty loud. That will definitely change in the future, as planes have gone a long way since their first flight in 1903. Back then, the Wright brothers started the Aerial Age with a 12-second flight traveling 120 feet in North Carolina. The top speed at that time was around 30 miles per hour, but it still seemed pretty impressive. The world's first passenger airline service took off just 11 years later. The flight from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida lasted 23 minutes. Covering the distance by car around the bay took about 20 hours, so that was a great time saver. The tickets cost $5 and were sold out 16 weeks in advance, but the airline went out of business in four months. The new age in aviation began in the 1950s when they introduced the turbofan engine. It became possible as they started using temperature-resistant materials and complex air cooling systems. Planes also became lighter as they were made of composite materials. The wings have also improved over the years. The airfoil, that's the part thanks to which the air travels faster above the wing than below it, became a real game changer. Thanks to it, the planes keep a low speed during takeoff, which means they move smoothly and burn less fuel. The fastest plane in the world so far is North American X-15. It was rocket-powered and made of aluminum and titanium. A huge wedge tail helped it stay stable at that super speed. The rocket plane set the world's altitude record, reaching an altitude of 67 miles. Oh, and to make it even more impressive, it happened back in 1967. So, if it was possible back then already, why don't we all just fly rocket planes, or at least supersonics, especially on long-distance flights? In terms of speed, passenger planes are still where they were 50 years ago. Mostly because speeding flights up would also make them way more expensive. Flying faster means burning more fuel. Plus, supersonic engines are expensive to produce and maintain. Another reason is natural forces. The winds affect the speed of a plane, and no technology can control the wind. 
A strong tailwind can help it move forward at a higher speed, and a headwind can slow the aircraft down. Planes mostly fly at altitudes of up to 7 miles. Up there, the air is thinner, which means there's less resistance, and a plane can fly faster and save some fuel. Also, the lower temperatures make the jet engines more efficient. Another perk of flying through that part of the atmosphere is that it's less turbulent, so flights go smoother. Private jets can't fly that high. They're smaller, and their engines aren't strong enough to reach such an altitude, so they stick around to 15,000 feet. Ever notice those white trails that planes leave behind? Their official name is contrails, and they're like artificial clouds planes leave behind. When the plane reaches its cruising altitude, temperatures get quite low, about negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water turns into particles of ice. The higher the level of humidity is, the bigger those trails get, and you can see them long after the plane has disappeared. So, thick and long contrails can be a sign of an upcoming storm. Sometimes contrails can even be colorful. The droplets of water that are formed up in the atmosphere can freeze in different sizes. They all reflect sunlight at different wavelengths, causing the effect of a rainbow. When all the colors mix, it appears white, the most common contrail color. Airplanes don't take off with the wind, but actually against it. It's kind of like a kite. To make it fly, you launch it against the wind, and there it goes. That's because there are four forces of flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The lift is generated because the speed of the air is higher above the kite than below it. The kite is pushed upwards. This is the lifting force. Going through a storm is one pretty scary experience, but is it really as dangerous as it seems? In fact, the most critical moments in windy weather are takeoff and landing. Plane manufacturers test their aircraft and specify speed limits at which the pilots should move in different weather conditions. At some airports, the winds are pretty severe all year round, so landing can get pretty wobbly. It requires a real pro of a pilot to land when the wind strikes the runway. Sometimes, the wind unexpectedly changes its speed and direction. The pilot really has to know what they're doing to land when the wind direction changes. Otherwise, the risk of overshooting the runway is pretty real. Extreme heat is another weather condition that can stop a plane from flying. Airplanes fly by generating lift with their wings. The air below the wings takes the plane up. In extreme heat, an airplane can't produce that much lift. That's because hot air expands and becomes way less dense than cold air. With less lift, the plane may find it really hard to take off and fly. Electronics will unlikely respond well to extreme heat or humidity, and the AC system may fail. Smaller jets can't operate at a temperature of over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger Airbus and Boeing planes perform the best below 126 degrees Fahrenheit. Those mysterious chimes you hear during the flight are a kind of a secret language the crew uses to communicate with each other. The chime you hear shortly after takeoff informs the crew that the landing gear is getting retracted. A single chime during the flight is a sign that one of the passengers needs the assistance of the crew. When they're serving meals and run out of food and drinks, they can ask their colleagues to share using a high and low chime combo. Three low tones mean serious turbulence is approaching, so the crew needs to buckle up. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? You have nothing to worry about. It occurs when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and it switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. You've probably seen Hollywood movies where somehow a small hole opens up in the side of a plane and then immediately it's utter chaos. Food trays and bags flying, seat belts barely holding passengers in place. Luckily, in reality, small damage to the fuselage won't cause such dramatic consequences. But would you believe me if I told you there was a pilot that managed to land a plane with half the roof torn completely off? Buckle up. At 1.25 p.m. on April 28, 1988, a 19-year-old Boeing 737 that belonged to Aloha Airlines left Hilo International Airport and headed for Honolulu. The plane was named after Queen Liliokalani, who was the last sovereign monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii, 
On that day, the aircraft already had three short flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Apologies to the people of Hawaii for any mispronounced names. Anyway, all the trips were regular and uneventful. The weather was calm, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. The captain was experienced pilot Robert Shorn's timer, 44 years old, who had 6,700 flight hours in the Boeing 737. The first officer was Madeline Tompkins, 36 years old, who had flown more than 3,500 hours in the very same Boeing model. Early in the morning, still in Honolulu, the first officer had conducted the regular pre-flight inspection and announced that the plane was ready for the flight. At 11 a.m., the plane left Honolulu and headed for Maui and then to Hilo. When the plane arrived at the destination, the pilots didn't leave the cockpit or inspect the aircraft from the outside. After all, it wasn't a requirement, so they didn't have to. Following schedule, the plane started the last leg on their routine round trip at 1.25 p.m. There were 95 people on board the aircraft, 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who stayed in the observer seat in the cockpit. After a normal takeoff and ascent, the plane got to the usual cruising altitude of 24,000 feet, and then, at about 1.48 p.m., 26 miles away from Kaolui, the unexpected happened. Those who were in the cockpit heard a loud whooshing sound and then a crack, followed by the deafening sound of wind seconds later. Apparently, a small part of the roof on the left side tore loose, which led to the explosive decompression of the plane. But the worst thing was that the decompression caused a ripple effect, which led to a huge section of the airplane's roof to tear off completely. The length of the missing part was 18.5 feet long. It was all part of the aircraft's skin that covered the plane from the cockpit back to the four-wing area. At first, the pilots didn't realize what had happened. The first officer, who was in control of the aircraft at that moment, felt her head jerk backward, and she noticed debris and gray pieces of insulation flying chaotically around the cockpit. When the captain turned his head, he saw that the cockpit door had disappeared, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring at a clear blue sky. The plane started to roll from side to side, and it was becoming increasingly harder to control. Everybody who was in the cockpit immediately put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over the aircraft. He prod the speed brakes into action, and began an emergency descent towards the nearest airport, which was on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were in their seats at the moment when the accident happened, and since the seatbelt sight was still on, everyone had their seatbelts fastened. However, all three flight attendants were standing along the aircraft aisle. The one who was the closest to the front of the plane was swept out through the hole in the roof. The other two were thrown to the floor by a forceful jerk. But while one of them hit her head really hard and lost consciousness, the other one started to crawl along the aisle in an attempt to help passengers and calm them down. At that same time, the pilots were trying to contact air traffic control and signal an emergency. To make matters worse, they couldn't hear each other and had to use gestures to communicate. They also didn't know whether the radio worked and whether they had managed to deliver their message. The flight controls were sluggish and loose, and the captain was struggling to control the plane. The first officer, right by his side, dealing with communication and assisting the captain. It turned out that the controller hadn't been receiving the crew's messages until the aircraft descended to the altitude of 14,000 feet. Only then did the signal get through, and Maui Tower started urgent preparations for an emergency landing. The problem was that at that time, in case of an emergency, the airport control tower had to dial 911 just like anyone else. On top of that, the controller didn't catch that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. After all, the crew only announced that they had experienced a rapid decompression, so the controller wasn't aware of the entire gravity of the situation. In the meantime, the plane had already dropped to a height of 10,000 feet above sea level. The captain removed his oxygen mask and withdrew the speed brakes. The plane was steadily descending toward runway 2 of Kaolui Airport. Following the captain's command, the first officer lowered the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't come on. That could mean that either they had a bad light, or they had serious problems with the nose gear. But that wasn't the only problem. As the plane was approaching the runway, the left engine failed, 
and the aircraft started rocking and shaking. The captain made an attempt to restart the engine, but didn't succeed. And yet still, with the help of the reverse thrust of the second still working engine, at 1.58 p.m., just 10 minutes after the emergency and 35 minutes after the takeoff, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 did manage to touch down on the runway of Kaolui Airport and come to a complete stop. Landing a plane with such a huge loss of integrity was an unprecedented feat. As soon as the plane stopped, the evacuation began. Everyone on the plane, except for the one flight attendant who had been pulled out of the plane, was alive, although 65 people were injured. Most people had been hurt by flying debris and torn pieces of fuselage. Unfortunately, since nobody on the ground had known how serious the situation was, no ambulances were waiting for the injured. The first one arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, and there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which obviously couldn't fit all the people. That's why the passengers had to be transported to the hospital in several 15-passenger tour vans that belonged to the company Akamai Tours. Luckily, two Akamai drivers used to be paramedics, so they started to tend to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, airport mechanics, as well as office staff, drove the vans to the hospital, which was three miles away. Luckily, there were only eight serious injuries, from which all of these passengers later recovered. As for the plane, it was damaged beyond repair and later dismantled right at the airport. The missing part of the roof disappeared and was never seen again. But what could cause such a terrible accident? The problem wasn't the age of the aircraft. 19 years isn't that old for a commercial plane. And it hadn't accumulated too many flight hours before the accident happened. But the 35,500 flight hours the plane had traveled included 89,680 takeoffs and landings, which are also called flight cycles. The reason for such a huge number was that the plane performed mostly short domestic flights between the islands. And this number exceeded the number of flight cycles the plane was designed for twice over. Besides, the plane traveled in a salty and humid environment, which also added to the wear and tear. Interestingly, during one interview that followed the accident, passenger Gail Yamamoto remembered that she had spotted a crack in the fuselage when she was boarding. Unfortunately, she was the only one who had seen the damage, and the woman hadn't thought that the crack was important enough to inform the crew. It's important to stress that these kinds of accidents are extremely rare these days. According to Harvard University, given all the steps and measures major airlines and airports take to ensure safety, the odds of you being in an airplane accident is roughly 1 in 1.2 million. That's a 0.000083% chance. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. And even if something were to happen, like, for example, half the roof falling off, it's a great comfort to know that your trained pilots can still land the plane relatively safely. Why do cats like to like people? Whoops, that's supposed to read lick people. Sorry. There are a few potential reasons for this. First, they're collecting biochemical information from your skin. They could also be marking you as one of their possessions. Admit it, this totally sounds like cats. And it could be that they're just letting you know they trust you. Or at least showing you they don't find you to be some serious threat or competition. How come bananas get sweeter as they ripen? Fruits don't disperse their seeds randomly. They do it when animals eat them. At a certain stage, they suddenly increase their sugar content, which is how they try to encourage animals to eat them at that stage, specifically when their seeds are mature. Mature seeds have developed special coatings that protect them when um, passing through the uh, animal's digestive system. Do I have to paint you a picture? Why does our skin get wrinkly after we spend time in water? After 5 to 10 minutes in the bathtub, you will notice there are small wrinkles forming on your feet and hands. Scientists speculate that it could be the way our body gets a better grip when immersed in a slippery environment. Our wrinkly fingers improve our grip on submerged or wet objects. Also, they channel water away in a similar way to the rain treads on car tires. When you eat something really sour, you just don't feel it on your tongue. Sometimes your entire face contracts, so everyone around can see that you don't like the food you're eating. 
that specific sour flavor that causes this reaction is the result of the hydrogen ions that acids release when they mix with saliva. Yes, that's a mouthful of science. At the moment when your mouth detects this sign of an acid, it sends you a message in a pretty dramatic way so you can't ignore it. It's an evolutionary response that made sense in the old times because many of the plants that our ancestors found in nature and later wanted to consume were poisonous, especially plants with sour flavors. So even today, your taste receptors light up and your face twists in a way that is out of your control when you taste something like that. Like this. A lighter color on an airplane is actually heavier than darker paint. The color white requires a higher solid content than black to get the necessary saturation. And the higher the solid content is, the heavier the paint is going to be. Which is why white paint is one of the heaviest. But white planes are more efficient than black ones, although this also depends on how you define efficient. The white paint reflects more sunlight than the dark one. Different colors absorb different wavelengths of light, and white objects heat up more slowly compared to darker ones. This results in a cooler interior, which is why it's easier for the entire plane to remain cool. If your hot tea tastes odd when you drink it out of a plastic cup, don't worry, it's not just you. You might imagine that the tea is dissolving something from the plastic, but this most likely isn't the case. The taste you perceive is not just the action of your taste buds. All senses are contributing here. That's why strawberry mousse has a sweeter taste on a white plate than on a black one. And you get the feeling chips are crunchier when you hear those specific higher frequency sounds as you eat them. Also, hot chocolate has a better taste when you drink it from an orange cup. We are kind of conditioned to drink hot tea from ceramic cups, which is why seeing it in a plastic cup subconsciously makes us expect vending machine tea that won't taste good. Flamingos often stand on one leg, and one theory says that's because it helps them conserve body heat. One piece of evidence for that is that they tuck one leg up more often in water than on land. Others believe this is how they save energy, not heat. These birds are definitely more stable on one leg when it comes to standing for long periods of time. That's because they can lock the tendons and ligaments in their legs in a stable position, which means their muscles don't have to work hard to stay in one place. Plus, it's actually a classic look, don't you think? Why do repetitive noises annoy us so much? It's simple. They're constantly attracting our attention so we can't focus on other things. We stop reacting to certain repetitive sounds like ticking clocks really quickly. But some are just too annoying, like a slowly dripping faucet. The reason why this bothers us so much is the lack of control. When you know you can stop the noise anytime you want, you won't find it that annoying. Why do all planets make circles around the sun in the same direction? It would be cool to go back 4.6 billion years you'd be able to see that space wasn't empty back then, even though our solar system wasn't formed yet. There was a cloud of dust and gas in a place where, today, our sun and the planets are. This cloud was like a solar nebula, and it molded our solar system. Generally speaking, a nebula is a huge cloud of gas and dust that occupies the space between stars and helps form new ones, together with the planets that orbit them. When this nebula collapsed, its center became our sun, while the rest of the matter got together and created the planets we know today, together with their moons and the rest of the rocky bodies like asteroids. The matter was quickly rotating, and the process looked a bit like cheese dough flattening into a disk that was getting bigger and bigger. Since the cloud was moving in a certain direction to begin with, all of the planets retained the same orbital plane too. Something massive needs to happen to alter a planet's orbit and force it to go in the opposite direction around the sun. Why do some people have such a good singing range? There are three things that can affect the general range of sounds coming out of your mouth. The strength of your diaphragm, the size of your vocal folds, and the shape of the chambers in your sinuses. But making the sound beautiful is largely a question of practice. Practice? Yep. At the basic level, you hear a note and reproduce it with your voice. 
But the true difference between being able to just hold a tune and having a lovely singing voice is related to the thousands of small muscle contractions that are mostly unconscious. They adjust your muscle mechanism where you produce a voice with the emotions you have while singing. Like with other musical instruments, a wider finger span can help you while playing the piano. But the rest is learning those subtle things like pressure on the keys and timing. Now, why do dogs hear higher pitches than us? Humans hear frequencies up to approximately 20 kilohertz and dogs up to 45 kilohertz. Nearly all mammals can hear higher frequencies than other vertebrates. Birds hear up to 12 kilohertz and reptiles, amphibians, and fish up to 5 kilohertz. Mammals don't need to hear high frequencies to communicate with each other, but so they can locate where a certain sound is coming from. The special way of hearing that mammals use, binaural spectral difference cueing, works in a way that our brain compares the frequency range of a sound as it gets to each ear. Head shadows one ear, so some of the frequencies get absorbed, and our brain absorbs higher frequencies more than lower ones. And the smaller the head, the less effect it has on lower frequency sounds. That's why the animal must be able to hear high frequencies to hear a wider spectrum of sounds. A mouse needs to hear up to 90 kHz, and an elephant is fine with just 10. Dogs have smaller heads than us, so they're in the middle category. Why are oceans salty? Well, chemically speaking, salt is sodium chloride. And the salt in the ocean isn't just these two, but many other ions like calcium and magnesium. Most of these start out like rocks on land. Certain things like wind and rain erode these rocks, which basically means they gradually wear them away. So we can say most of the salt in the ocean comes from rocks. Minerals from these rocks leach into streams and rivers. They carry the salt away into the ocean. About 85% of the ions in the ocean are sodium and chloride, while magnesium and sulfate make up around 10%. And some of the salt that ends up in the ocean doesn't stay there. Animals consume a lot of it. But because of a steady supply of runoff from the surface, levels of salinity are pretty much constant. The ocean also gets its salt from one more source – hydrothermic fluids. Magma coming from behind the Earth's crust heats up deep sea vents. When they get hot enough, they lead to chemical reactions between the seawater and all the minerals from the rocks around the vents. That's why every part of the ocean is salty, but the level of salinity depends on where in the world you are. So, take that with a grain of… Eh, you know. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and 